So um, I decided on doing a, a small program which demonstrates uh, some GUI, um, some file processing, demonstrates how to use custom errors, um, how to use iterators. Uh, just something small I, I, can, I can fit possibly within a one hour session. So I decided on doing an image viewer. So uh, I'm also going to show you um, my particular workflow, what tools I use to develop in Rust as well. And you'll find that, that what the, the system that I use is practically the same on all major operating systems. So if you're using Mac OS, if you're using Windows, if you're using Linux, it doesn't matter. It should roughly be the same. So I'm going to share my screen now. And hopefully you can all see my screen. Say so someone say yes if you can see my screen. Yes, yes, sir. All right, so let's 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 start by creating a project. So I'm gonna quickly make a, a, a directory for my project. I'm gonna call my um, image viewer RVU, standing for Rust View. And let's go into into actually what I should. I should actually remove um, RVU because I'm going to create it using Cargo. And if I do Cargo new RVU, it should it should create a binary package for me, and then I can see the into that. Also, so um, in there you should see a Cargo Toml uh, file, which which essentially describes the project, um, and you should see a source folder, which inside that will be um, the most important program in the world, a program that prints Hello World. Now you can, you can run, you can build and run this immediately um, by using Cargo Run, or if you're lazy like I am, Cargo R, and that will both build and run it, and there you see Hello World. But we want a, a little better uh, development environment than, than the command console. So, um, by typing, uh, if you've got Visual Studio co code installed, by typing code uh, dot, you open the current directory. And that should, um, no, I don't trust myself. Um, that should uh, open up um, Visual Studio code with your project on the left. Now, you should see the source directory and the main. And since I built it, some more files have popped up. A cargo lock has popped up, which basically locks down any dependencies and, and their versions. That means um, that when you uh, rebuild something, it will use the original versions um, that you use when you first built it. This allows you to ensure that the binary is the same every time you build it. Um, there is a way of, of upgrading to the latest version. So if you update your crates, um, I'll show you that later. Um, there's also a target folder, which is where all the intermediate files of the Rust compiler uh, builds. And in there, there should be a, a, a debug folder. Uh, and right there is, is the RVU. And in fact, if you press uh, Control backtick, you would get a terminal in code. And you can, you can see um, all the files there. And I can, and I can just actually run um, RVU and currently prints Hello World. Um, if you want to install a program on, on your system, you can type in cargo um, install. Go back to the uh, root directory. You can do type in cargo install path. I think this works. And that will build a, a release version, which you can, see, you can see a new release folder here. And it will be somewhere where you, um, where your path points to if you installed Rust properly. So I can go to a different folder and type RVU and it will just work. Okay. Let's uh, quickly uh, go back to a folder and let's start to do, do some proper uh, coding. So the first thing we want to do is um, open up a window. And we, we're going to use a crate to do this. And this crate is called Winit. Winit allows you to open a, a window in a, in a cross-platform way that, um, so that works the same on all the platforms, Mac OS, 
um, Windows, Linux, even even phone uh, phones like Android and Mac and um, um, iOS. But um, before we, we we do that, we, let's let's say prove uh, Visual Studio that we can build from inside Visual Studio without typing cargo R all the time. So within, um, if you open up main RS, you can press function one and you can look for um, uh, configure default build task. And if you, if you press that, uh, oh, no, nope, this is not working, I forgot one step. So we need to add some extensions uh, before we could do any, any more Rust uh, programming. So you go to the extensions button, you type in there, type in Rust, and what you want to install is the Rust Analyzer, this one here. So we install that one. And to debug, you want to type LLDB. And we want to install this code LLDB right here. And I like adding um, even better TOML here to, uh, to help me edit TOML files. So I installed that one. And one useful thing which um, I like using is, is rewrap, um, which allows me to uh, reformat re, um, comments that, that span multiple lines by pressing Alt Q. OK, so now we've done that. I can go back to this. I can def configure the default build task. And, and now some new options appear. And I want um, uh, my build task to be just check for now. So this will just will generate a task.json file in a, in a VS code. And what I like to do is if I press comma, uh, press return, type PRE to, and then press enter to accept presentation. Um, that, I press, uh, that will autofill all the things that can appear in presentation. And I like changing the clear one from false to true. This means that every time I build, it's gonna clear the terminal. Um, so, so any error messages or warnings uh, are just from that session. And another thing I like to do is assign a function key to it. So if I press Control K, Control S, I bring up the keyboard shortcuts. You can also find it by going um, to preferences here and keyboard shortcuts here. And then I, if I look for build, I've got this run build tasks. It's already control shift B, but I like using function seven because uh, of software I previously used. So I hit function seven and return that. So now if I hit function seven, you should see at the bottom, we're running cargo check. Now what does cargo check do? Cargo check just checks the syntax of your code to make sure it, 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 it's, it, it will build uh, without actually building. So this is pretty fast. And it's very useful to do that um, all the time. And also, any errors will appear there. For example, if I get rid of that, hit function seven, I can see my errors really easily here. And I can, I can, I can, um, as I hover over the line number, I can hold control, and I'll change to a finger, and I can click that, and it'll go straight to um, the error. Also, you should you should see the error underlined, and if you click on that. You can hit control. Um, um, you can just, just fix it. Um, but quite often, when you see uh, squigglies like this, um, you can hit control dot and it will show some actions. But at the moment, there's no code actions available. And I will be making use of code actions a lot in this editor. Um, so uh, we can also run it uh, from uh, Visual Code as well. And we do, if we do that by, um, if I look for, start debugging, you can see it's assigned to function five. So out of the box, we can hit function five. And it's gonna complain because it doesn't know how to run this. So we click okay here. And it asks us, um, would you like to generate uh, configurations for these targets? And we're gonna say yes for this. And this is going to create a launch JSON file, which is another JSON file, uh, which, which essentially um, sets up some launchers. And launchers appear when you press this, 
and you have this drop down here. And since we don't have any unit tests in uh, RVU, we're going to delete that section. And then as, as, as at the same time, same time, um, I think we can do, no, no. Okay. And that's all you need. So if you hit function five, it should, it should build and run. And the first time you do it, um, it won't switch the terminal. So you can switch the terminal and you see hello world there. If you hit it a second time and it will work. So we can test that. We can say, hello, Rust meetup. Save that, hit function seven, it checks okay. Don't, don't have to press function seven. Uh, function five will, will just automatically build it. And there you go. It all works. Right, so now we're going to install some crates. So I talked about installing Win in it, and to allow it, it to be a lot easier to install crates, I like to install a cargo plugin called Cargo Edit, and we can install it really easy by just typing cargo um, install cargo edit. Now soon, um, cargo edit is going actually going to be incorporated into the vanilla cargo. So you, you won't even have to do this. But for now, we're just going to install it like this. And, and what this allows us to do is to easily um, add crates to a project. It will, normally when you add uh, crates to a project, you would go into cargo toml and under the dependencies, you would, you would, set, you would set some dependencies right here. But I, I like to do it in a more simpler way. And cargo edit allows us to do that. So. What cargo will do is that when you um, the set the first word you put after cargo is the cargo command, and if cargo doesn't understand it, it will look for a program called cargo hyphen and that command, um, and it will it will try to run it for you. So, any questions? Well, yes, we had one in the chat. Are you using? Okay. Um, I don't know how to pronounce open SUSE, <laughs> the operating system. Okay. Oh, let's have a look. What, what operating system are you using? No, I'm using Arch Linux. Uh, I, I, I did it from scratch and I put, just added KD Plasma on top of that. Okay. So. Unfortunately, Cargo Edit seems to pull in every uh, every crate in the world. The one downside to doing everything the proper way from scratch. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. If I uh, resize this uh, and I can see the chat then. If I do that, how do we get the terminal panel at the bottom of Visual Studio? The Visual Studio, um, you press Control Back Tick. The Back Tick is the button that's to the left of your one key, and that should open up the terminal. Give it a go and let me know if you if it works for you. I guess it's worth being clear as well that this is um, Visual Studio code, not fully yes. fledged Visual Studio. So keyboard shortcuts won't exactly match up <laughs> if, uh, if you're using Visual Studio community. I'd recommend VS Code for Rust though over Visual Studio. hundred <laughs> percent. I, I, I wouldn't. I would recommend not using Visual Studio at all for anything other than C++ or C sharp. Uh, it, it's a bloated monstrosity <laughs> of an editor. Sound advice. Uh, I even use Visual Studio Code for C++ nowadays. Oh, well, this is taking longer than I expected. Um, so I apologize for this. So any questions while... Um... Uh, yes, it is, because it, it's, it's, it Cargo Edit works on the uh, local Cargo Toml file, so so Cargo Workspace doesn't matter because all your subfolders within a Cargo Workspace will be uh, will have their own Cargo Toml files. 
so you just CD into into those directories and just use cargo, um, the cargo edit commands. Now, uh, someone said about uh, Magit. So Magit's pretty good, but I actually like to use a, a tool called Git UE, which is actually written in Rust. You can type in cargo install Git UE. Um, that's if I type it here. Um, and that will um, install a, a terminal-based uh, Git system. And for, for most things, it's, it's pretty good. It's really easy to use. Uh, if you want more sophisticated mechanisms then it, it's it's not that great i haven't used i think i've used lady git once i think i preferred git ue but it's it's all subjective there we go so we're here finally finally okay so we want to add win it so what we're going to do we're just going to do cargo add win it and and it's going to list all the features that you might want to use um, with this crate, but we don't. So have you noticed in Cargo Tommel, it's going to appear there with the latest version. So we're going to go quick, go quickly in and let's let's open up a window. The first thing you want to do is create a event loop. Now the event loop is what collects all the messages and sends mess, uh, sends events uh, to your window. So we're going to. And we're going to type in event loop new here. Uh, and now when we when we check it and build it, it's it's gonna um, it's gonna do all the stuff that Winit needs. Unfortunately, uh, let me carry on. And uh, once you've done that, you you want to um, create a window. So we do this by by using window builder, which is which is a an object in a Winit, and we'll say we want to create a new one, and and with a with a builder object we can state how we want a window to look. So we can type in with title. Um, let's just say um, RVU for now, and. We'll, we'll, we'll build it and we pass in the event loop that we want to associate with the window. Okay, so once we once we uh, done that, we then start the event loop. Now if I save this, you're going to find there's some wigglies around here and it's going to say we fail to resolve. It doesn't know what event loop is. So what you can do is press control full stop and it's not working. Why aren't you working? Um, is it? All oh, right, down the bottom here, you can see Rust Analyzer is thinking, and 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 basically it's going through all my all the crates and, and putting in the stuff. So when this finishes, we'll have support in the uh, in the editor. But for now, um, let's uh, let's do it manually. Because we're being very very slow here. So we're going to use uh, win init, and we're going to use a bed loop. So that's going to should hopefully get rid of that. Um, no, Was Rust Analyzer it's... actually enabled on um, on it yet? Because it's not not giving you the little. Um, no, it is. It's just thinking. It, it's thinking about it because it, it it's see that spinning thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's it's taking a long time. I I, I don't know why, uh, but um, maybe I should start it again. Um, okay. Um, anyway. To, to then we start the event loop, and this this basically takes a a, a function, 
uh, a lambda, a, a, closure, a, a closure, however you want to call it. Um, and it's, oh my God, I'm, it's, apparently I'm using an American keyboard now. Oh dear. Um, And this is this is an infinite loop. So main is 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 not gonna um, exit. So any code you put after this event loop run is not is not gonna run. Um, for example, if I put a uh, uh, command to say hello here, um, and then just check that, it's gonna say unreachable statement. A window bill is not found in the scope, so. Is this going to work? No, it's still not going to work. So, window builder is under the window. Okay. Um. What did I do wrong? I forgot the semicolon. Okay, we're good. We're good so far. So we want to we want to be able. So what happens is that the event loop is going to call this this closure that we provide, and it's going to pass in a, a three arguments. Now the middle argument we don't really care about, but the first argument is the event that's, that that's passing through, and you should check that event and then act upon it. The control flow is just an enum which basically says how we're going to handle the messages um, or, 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 or whether we should exit. And so the, the, there's, um, there's two types of control flows we can do. There's one which is wait, which basically means that your function is going to get called whenever this event happens and only when an event happens. And there's also a version called poll where your function can get called as quickly as possible, continuously. So the poll one is really good if you're doing games. The wait one's really good if you're doing like a tool. And since we're doing a tool, we're going to set the control flow to um, wait. Control flow. Um, is in the event loop as well. So we need to add it here. I'm really annoyed that REST Analyzer isn't working properly at the moment. I'm going to quit that and I'm going to bring it up again. See what happens. Okay, so now we got we it's working a bit, bit better. Um, we've got uh, the yellow wigglies in there, which means the warning. And if you put most of it, say we're not using it, which is true. So we now want to check on the events, and there's there's a, there's a few events that we want to want to look at. So we'll match on the event, and and as it's working now. So if I press Control Dot. There's a, there's a section saying fill match arms. If I press that, you can see all the different enumerations that event could possibly be. But we only, we only care about a, a few. We only care about um, the window event and redraw re requested. Uh, and because we have to do all the arms, we'll, we'll do a, a catch all the bottom, which does nothing. Okay, so um, so, look, we, so we want to check some um, the window events. And the window events would be events that affect the windows directly themselves, such as keyboard um, controls, um, hitting the close button, that kind of stuff, resizing. So we want to um, 
do something here. So we, we only want to do this if um, the window ID equals the window that we created. Now there's something else I, I, I missed out as well. Um, after after um, installing Rust Analyzer, what you can do, you can go to your settings and you can um, type in Rust format and you can enable Rust, uh, Rust format here. And that means that whenever you save, um, oh, no, sorry, not here. Um, There's a, there's a way of saving on format, format the file on save. You want to click on that. And I think is that enough? So if I save that, you, you can see that everything's been reformatted. Um, but I'm pretty sure. A, a default format, uh, we want to choose that. And we want to use um, Rust Analyzer here as well. OK. Now, now we, uh, we want to match on, on the event we've get to the window. Uh, so let's quickly do that. So we want to match event here. And we gain, we can hit, we can fill them, the arms here. And there's loads and loads of um, events we can match on. And right now we only care about a few. We, we care about the resized. We, we care about close requested. Keyboard input. Uh, and scale factor changed. Again, we need a catch-all to satisfy Rust. And resize, we're just going to make that do nothing for now. Uh, close requested. This is what happens when you press the, the, the close button. And basically, we want control flow to be exit. And I also want to detect the escape button just for, just for um, convenience. And so to do this, we, you, we use a much more uh, sophisticated match uh, system. So we, we care about input. We want to match against input. And the, the input um, needs to match against the keyboard input, which itself, um, as a state member, which is element state, Rest and a virtual key code, which is some virtual key code. And then we'll do a dot dot say we don't care about the other members of, of that event. And again, another dot dot there. And it we could do control flow because control flow it. Again, keyboard is unknown yet, so we press con uh, control dot, and now we can see the import. So if we, we can just hit the import, and it will add keyboard input automatically at the top here. Again, with virtual key code. Um, is that not working? Did I spell it wrong? Ah, you did. We input that. And now we should be able to. Um, oh, what do I do wrong here? Um, you just need to unwrap it. But, um, it's still in a result. Either. No, it, it should. It should um, be a. Ah, oh, as a result. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Let's unwrap that. For now. And we'll. Now there's a window ID. 
Okay. Right. So we, we've got some errors. Um, so, uh, let's let's get some rid of these uh, warnings. So we can we can not deal with these by just putting the scores in front of them. And oh no, that's not how you do it. Let's um, do that. Okay, so so what's happening here is that um, the the function here that that's defined here might outlive the window, and because we're using window inside, if we if we, we we're using it um, right here, and so what we need to do is tell Rust that we want to move all the variables in the scope into the, the closure, and that should get rid of that. So if we run this now, uh, it's taken a while to build. I don't know why it's not working. Let's just, just do it from here. Oh, something's blocking it, that's why. Um, let's shut this down. Should this actually work? <clears throat> What did we meet, miss? What did we miss? I think there was still a to-do in the code. Uh, there's a to-do somewhere. Right there, OK. We missed that. OK. There was one at reader or requested as well. What's going on here? So um, under redraw requested. Oh, we missed another one. My apologies. OK. And there we go. We've got a window. Unfortunately, you, you see in the background, on Windows, you'll just see a black uh, window uh, because Windows by default will clear the screen, clear this. But right now, we've, we've got, uh, we actually got a window. And if you press Escape or the Close button, it should close. Great. Um, let's 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 uh, um, let's carry on. Right. So the next thing we want to do is is we don't like this um, unwrap right here uh, that we did when we created the uh, window, and we kind of want to uh, be able to exit uh, with an error if that fails. So to do that, we need to get main to return a, a result. And but uh, what what error are, are we going to return? What, what type are we going to return? So this is where we use some more crates to implement um, our own sort of uh, custom errors. And the crate I like to use is called this error. So we go here, cargo add this error. And uh, let's build that. Uh, and what this error allows us to do is make it really easy to combine error messages with enumerations and other features so that um, we can we can we, it's a lot easier to 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 create our custom errors that also uh, conform to the uh, error trait 
So to do this, we're, we're going to create a, a new enum, which which will be our errors. RVU error. And, and we want to create an error now um, to dealing with unable to uh, create the window. So if you take away the unwrap right here, we can see that it returns an OS error as an error. So what we do is with the um, enum and using uh, this error, we derive debug and and error. So as I type error, you can notice that the Visual Studio Code is showing, uh, should I uh, show a drop down? If I press enter, this error will should appear automatically up there. So this basically marks um, this, the, by deriving from error, the compiler will then analyze the enum and then generate a lot of extra information um, to allow custom errors to work quite nicely. And the first error we're going to do is um, a window error. So we're going to create a, a, a enum there. And we want it to contain the, the original error, the OS error um, that we had before. And we do this by, by typing uh, from OS error. And then we want to um, add a string describing what, what the error is. So when, when the program eventually exits, you'll get a meaningful text. And we do that with um, the error macro. Unable to create window. And that's all we need. Um, all right, we need to say where OS error comes from. So we can again use control dot import that. Um, and we can now use RVU error here. And then in the window stuff, in the window stuff, um, we can convert, get rid of the result uh, by doing question mark. And the result will, the RVU error will take the OS error and automatically convert it to the RVU error because we said from OS error right here. But we can, we can do slightly better than that. We can do our own type. Um, and this, this result can be, uh, let's have a look. Um, this is, result could be the standard result. Okay, and then we can get rid of this altogether right here. And we should be able to build that, and it, and it works. Okay, moving swiftly on. So now we want to actually um, be able to uh, take a file name as, as a parameter. And to, we use another... Um, it's called clap to do this. So let me quickly add it. Um, uh, just to say to um, RVU error is actually my own error. It's my own custom um, enum enumeration. It's not part of any crate. But I'm using the, uh, the error um, derive macro to generate the extra information so that automatic um, conversions can happen with the question mark. So we, we've added um, clap. And actually, what I should have done is do a plus derive because you want the derive feature as well. And we should see it in Cargo Tomo. Uh, we now have clap with the derive feature automatically in there. So what we want to do is be able to say we want to take a file name as, as a parameter. Now, Clap could do a ton of things. So the, the, how I'm going to use it is very simplistic. And what I do is I, I, want, to, I want to create a, a structure which is going to house all my configuration information. And the structure for config, I just want it to contain the file name. 
which is which is what the user is going to pass to it. But to make this um, to to be able to pass that and to and to check it, uh, we're going to use the clap crate and we're going to um, derive of a debug and the clap parser. And uh, also, we're going to uh, type in clap and two keywords in here, which is going to basically state what I want to show when I type in um, the help option on my application. So clap will automatically um, add uh, a version and a help um, command line option. So you can do minus H or minus minus help or minus V or minus minus version. And it, it will it will show some information. And, and you notice that a lot of um, applications using Rust will have the same look and feel because of clap. And what we're going to do now here is just put a comment in here uh, uh, with three. It's going to be three slashes name of the image to view and this is a, this, this comment is going to be lifted out by clap uh, and then and then displayed when you ask for help and be, because this this string is not an option an optional string it's if it, it forms clap that you have to provide it so to be able to get that that uh, an instance of that config we just do get config equal config and right now we're, we're gonna we really need to um, fix these squiggles. Rust analyzer isn't uh, very good at um, dealing with um, symbols within derived statements, so we need to do. Um, oops. Okay, so let's run this. And we're not we're not um, using config, so let's put another call for now. So let's let's quickly run this and see what happens. So if I run it by itself, hopefully it will complain because we haven't provided a, a, a an image. And there we go. So let's run it again without the extra stuff. So it's going to say it's going to give me the error. The following required algorithm is not provided. File name, and it shows me the usage. And this is all generated by Clap itself. And if I actually um, ask for help, so by putting a double dash after the cargo command, anything that follows is passed onto your your application. So I'm going to do type help, and you will you will see. Um, the, the name of the program, the version, and the usage, and any arguments you add or options will be listed automatically. And notice how this string is being lifted up from here. And but I asked I asked Clap for the author and 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 the about, um, and they get that from the cargo stuff. So what you can do here, I can put in authors at US keyboard. I hate you. Um, and description. And if we force it to uh, recompile, run it again. You can see now there's my name and some uh, description. Okay. So Config should should take the file name. So if we if we just quickly print line um, file name, uh, actually, and then run that. Let's put in file name like foo. Let's close the window. We should say now the file name is foo. So the our command line parser is, is working and it's, it's really easy to, to do. Okay. Next thing we want to do is actually load the image. So we're taking the file name and we want to load the image. So we use yet another create called image. 
an image can load JPEGs, PNGs, anything we want, pretty much. So we're going to crack our add image. And we, and then we need to um, load up the image by looking at the file name in config. So we're going to let image equals image io beta open. And then we pass in the file name. We can do that quite easily from the config. And it's indexed at the moment. Um, so this is going to give a, uh, give us a result, and the, and I, I, it's funny. It's the result is um, an error, an image error. So we want to be able to handle that in our RVU error. So so what we can do here is let's create a new error and let's call it um, image error. And again, we want to be able to convert it from image error and so we're going to give some text saying um, an error occurred while processing the image. So now we can put a question mark at the end here. And I want to carry on calling API on that. So we're going to call uh, decode. And that's going to give us a dynamic image, but a result over a dynamic image and an image error. And we can pass in question mark again. So it, let's now get a dynamic image. So if any, if any part of this fails, main is going to exit immediately. And it's going to um, show this message here. Now, why are we getting a squiggle around here? Let's run it. Oh, right. Sorry. So the first one returns a an, an standard IO error. So let's let's handle that right now. Um, an error. All loading the image. And IO error. Okay. Oh, that comma shouldn't be there. Okay, great. And that's all we need. But um, we can also uh, figure out the size of the window according to the image we have. So I'm going to write some um, code quite quickly. So the first thing we're going to do is find out what the primary monitor is. Um, this, we need to, we'll, um, eventually, we will tell you what that is. Monitor. And now we now we've got a, re, a result here, an, an option, and we want to turn that um, we want to turn that into an error if if we don't have a primary monitor. So we can use OK or which which um, if an op, if an option is some, then it will just extract what's in the option. If it is none, then it will return uh, a result. So we're going to create a new um, error and we're going to call it no primary monitor and add it to our errors here Okay, 
Okay, great. So now we can, I can hit a question mark there, and now we've got a monitor handle. Uh, so let screen size equal the primary monitor dot size. And then I'm going to say, uh, let, let the max screen size, uh, which is basically the maximum size an image can, can be before I have to start scaling it down. And I'm going to make this a tuple. So the first, the first, the first part would be uh, just the width, and the second part would be the height. And I'm going to put a little um, multiplier, a percentage thing here, uh, to cater for um, the room I might need for borders and frames. Uh, how, how much rest do you use in your day job? None at all, unfortunately. Okay, so let's add the constant green percent and make it equal to 90%. What's going on here? Uh, what happened here? Ah. Screen width. Oh, right. So I need to make value three two. Now I need to calculate the the um, the horizon the, the actual scaling factor. So I do that. Um, I say that I work at the horizontal scale first. And I work out the uh, vertical one. And the scale that I end up using is going to be the, the maximum of the two. Right. Um, Max is in a standard library. So we're going to quickly import that and calculate. Calc scale is going to be a function that I'm going to quickly write here. So if we say if the maximum size um, is greater than equal the current size, we're all good. So we'll return one as a, as a scale. It's an inverse scale, actually. Um, otherwise, we'll work out the scale by quick division, find the uh, seeding of it, and convert it back to U32. OK. And now we've got the scale, we can work out our uh, uh, actual window size. So we're, we're going to pass the window builder. So we can say let window inner size equals physical size. And now uh, we can just pass that on to before the build. We can say uh, with inner size window inner size. Um, so let's um, let's try running this um, with an argument. I want to know why it's not working before. Um, is it? I don't know why it's not working. Uh, stop that then. So I do have um, I do have an image here that we can use right here, and I'm going to put it into
hey, so that's the image I'm going to use. I, I don't like C++, so I'll scrap that one out. And I, I'm going to push that into the directory. Um, I put that to Rust. And then put that to RV. OK, so hopefully, um, go back to here. Let's, let's actually print out. Is it the bug? All right, can you remember which one it is? Or is it DBG? Uh, is it capital D? Yes, DBG. Okay. Oh, DBG. So we're, we're going to load um, the Rust Meetup JPEG. And you can see that uh, it detected the image is 600 by 338, and our window is now resized according to it. But now, it, this will not be any good if you don't actually print the actual um, image on the screen. So I'm going to use one more um, crate. Um, uh, the, the, the debug macro is really useful for just quickly printing out exactly what, what the value of, of a variable is. And then, I find it very useful. OK, so we're going to um, use a crate called Pixels. And what Pixels does, it gives you a, um, a buffer where you can just write uh, color codes into it and uh, be able to display it um, within the window. Very useful for doing very simple 2D games um, and programs like that, or an image viewer. OK. So. We want to create a, after we create the window um, to work with, with pixels, we need to create a surface. A surface is what um, we'll render to. And so the surface needs to be the same size as a window. Okay, so we're going to pour surface texture, and it's in pixels um, right here. And in new, it's going to take a width, which would be a window inner size width. It's going to take a height. And it's going to take a reference to the actual window itself. Okay. Once we've done that, we can then create the, the uh, pixels object, which, which, will, which will hold the, the, um, the buffer that you're going to fill. This is going to be the same size as the actual image, because it's going to store the whole image. And we associate it with the surface. So the pixels now take uh, ownership of that surface. And if you look at that, um, let's see, uh, add that in four pixels. Um, did I do this correctly? Uh, let's have a look. It doesn't have new. Hmm. Don't tell me the pixels crate has changed the interface since I wrote this. So if you go to docs.rs, you can you can always check on um, documentation of a crate. Um, and there is a pixels thing here. And there is a new. So what happened? There. Let's see if we. Oh. There's an image pixel, so we don't want that. We, we, we chose the wrong one when we added it. 
So let's go back here. Um, import pixels. Ah, I need to do the bottom one down there. Okay, so we got another error, and this is a uh, pixels error, not this time. And so we want to need to add one more error to our RVU. Uh, unable to create pixel buffer to display image. And now we can just put a question mark on the end there. So it's, this, this error creates is really useful because I got all these different types of um, results and errors, and they can all be converted to the single one on the main right here. Very useful. OK, so now we've got the pixels. We, we need to um, be able to uh, render the image into the pixel buffer. So we need to get the actual bytes of the image from the dynamic, uh, the dynamic uh, image that we got up here. Okay. Okay, so now we got a, a slice, which is basically a reference to an array of U8. And this is the actual red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue um, image. But, and then we will. We'll get the actual buffer from the pixels object by typing get frame. Now, unfortunately, um, the pixels. Uh, Buffer takes four bytes, it's red, green, blue, alpha, red, green, blue, alpha. But we have a red, green, blue, red, green, blue format. So we need to con convert the three byte per color um, format into the four byte per color format. And this is where iterators come in handy. So we first of all, we need to uh, get frame is, uh, is immutable. So we need to make pixels mutable here. And the error should go. So what we want to do is move the data from inch bytes and then put it inside the pixel bytes uh, array. So we take the, we take the um, image byte and we, we, use a, we use a method for, called chunk exact. And that allows us to iterate on groups of, of elements at a time. Uh, by putting in three right here, we're going to iterate over three elements at a time, the red, green, and blue. And then what we want to do is um, bind it with the pixels uh, bytes. And we're going to chunk exact as well of four. So what that's going to do is it's going to produce an iterator that returns a tuple every single time. The first part is going to be the, the three bytes from the image, and the second part is going to be the four bytes from the pixel bytes. And let's get rid of this. Oh, thank you, Martin. Um, for, yes. And now we, we're going we, we're gonna, to we're gonna loop over each of them. And we pass in a a, a closure, which is going to take the image pixel and the uh, pixel we want to we want to write to. Okay, and all we're going to do is just sign it like this. So 
with the, with the uh, fourth one being just okay, uh, what did I do wrong here? I think you just got an extra bracket. I do wrong here. Before, wrong. before image ah. pixel, I think you have an extra yeah. bracket. Yep, yep. Oh, you're missing a bracket, yeah. <laughs> Um, so what's going on here? Why are these? Oh, because it's not, it's not, it's not mutable. Um, ah, right. So I use chunks exact, which is going to return a, a reference of four bytes at a time, but I need it to be mutable. So I use a chunks exact mute and now it should all work because I'm signing two pixels right here. Okay, um, so now I've, I've got the image on, on the buffer, and I, so now I need to render it. So I do that um, by responding to the uh, redraw requested event. And that's it, that's all I do. Um, and we, we want to we want to be handle resizing as well. So um, with the resize, this handle size here, and we're just going to call a, a, a method, a function we're going to call ourselves. We're passing the pixel buffer on the new size, and we're also going to do it with um, scale factor changed here. Uh, so we're going to. Unit size, we're going to take that. We're not going to care about the other one. And we're going to call OK. And the resize here. We just need to reset, resize the surface. And that's it. I think that's it. That's, that's... Oh, we can get rid of these now. We don't need these. And if we use the uh, previous one, fingers crossed, we'll have an image unless I screw something up. Any questions while this is going on? Um, the I I think maybe um, they different versions of the crates, unfortunately, because each crate has their own dependencies. And if the dependencies don't match up, if they use exact versions, for example, which is probably why it's it's probably best when you do in the cargo toml to remove the third uh, number of each of them. And there you go, hooray! It works. And what's more, because the the power of pixels, you can ex you can expand it and it will zoom up. Unfortunately, uh, if you have a really large image, it it won't do the opposite. It won't scale down, but here you go. The best image viewer you've ever seen in your entire life. And if you if you want to um, look at this, the source code, um, I've actually got it on, on GitLab right now. Um, on, where did I, where did I stick it? That code, RVU. Um, that that's a zero in, in code there. 
So let me stop sharing my screen and uh, perhaps I can answer any questions you might have. Awesome job, just so far I've got oh, lots I of thank yous. Anything. Can you hear Are you me? Muted? Yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, <laughs> mostly, got mostly just lots of thank yous in the, uh, <laughs> in the chat. Awesome You're welcome. Job, I, I hope it. I hope it will have little use. Um, someone quickly mentioned uh, about anyhow or this era. Um, anyhow is, is another crate for constructing um, uh, for um, this era. It's said to be used for creating a, um, uh, error uh, enumerations. Um, anyhow is tend it tends to be used by um, the user of crates to receive any error, no matter where it comes from. It can, it can cast any error to, to the it's, it's special anyhow error. Um, so the two are often seen to collaborate with each other. Uh, this error is used in libraries. Um, anyhow, it's tend to be used in binaries. How do you plan to transition your Rust skills to your day job? Very sneakily, um, I, I'm, I'm currently, um, I currently want to try and, if I can, if any tools, command line tools need to be written, I, I would probably recommend they're written in Rust, mainly because of the kick-ass command line um, parser that you, in, in CLAP that you saw there. Um, before before I used to use other crates to make clap a little bit better. Uh, one was called struct opt, which which did the clever um, decoding of your structure, and, and and that would call into clap API to to set your command line parser up. But now struct opt has been integrated inside clap, which is really cool. I have a question. Um, where next? What will you? What, what do you think you'll tinker with building next? Um, what do you mean for this meetup group as a small tool to demonstrate something, or just generally? Oh, a bit what, of both. Either. <laughs> well, currently, right now, what I'm doing in Rust is a is a, is a ZX Spectrum emulator. I'm I written one a while back, uh, an old eight bit computer uh, from the eighties. I'd written an emulator a while back in C++. I want to redo it in, in Rust. So that's my current Rust project at the moment. So I could play all the old games. Thanks for that walkthrough, Matt. Uh, I was just wondering, did you start creating the image display application as part of another project? Um, I know no. You previously no, mentioned the, the, the Ray Tracer challenge. And I know when I got to chapter yeah. two, my first thought was, <laughs> I want something to display these images. I was wondering how easy you would think it would be to convert it over to uh, to read in. Um, I can't remember which format they use in there, but it's a, it's a, a different file format. They, uh... Yes, they, they use a very simple um, file format called PPM, which which is um, which is simple because it's just text based. You literally write a, a textual header and you just dump some binary at the end. It's really, really simple, and they do that because they. They sneakily avoid the displaying of the image. They rely on you to, to use external tools to display the image. And, and PPM is the most easiest uh, image format to write an exporter from. Of course, if, you, if, you wanna, if, you, if you're writing in Rust, you just saw how easy Pixels is. Literally, you, you set Pixels up to the size um, of the buffer you want. You, you, you basically get frame, which gives you that slice of all the U8s. And you just you just write those pixels in into that into that array, and that's it. With with the win in it to um, f um, sort of structure around that, you can display it at the end after you ray trace. But I actually wrote this um, in an evening after the last meetup where I suggested I could do a image viewer in Rust, a small program. Stupidly, I suggested that, and and then I got committed to it by Kiara. She never mix, misses a trick that one, and so I just wrote it in, in an evening. I, I, re, I was really familiar with clap and image and, and pixels, so it wasn't too difficult um, for me to do that. Nice. That's Thank all really. If anyone else wants to commit themselves to a future meetup talk, <laughs> it would be very welcomed. <laughs> uh, let me ask you uh, one more question. 
Sure. Uh, my, and my impression is that the CPP camp is a, is a deep trench. I believe <laughs> Rust is also a very deep trench. And uh, how, <laughs> so you're, you're looking at the other side of the, the, the forest. <laughs> so mm -hmm. How are you going to, uh, to balance your efforts? Well, fortunately, uh, I only use C++ for a professional day job. Um, I've been using it for 30 odd years. Um, and so I know C++ very, very well. I also know how, how undefined behavior really screws your day up, uh, on, almost on a daily basis, right? Um, whether you've got dangling pointers, whether you've got um, null, null dereferencing, all that kind of stuff. And, and I... And with that coupled with object-oriented programming, which just just makes any code base look like spaghetti, um, I, I've just had a miserable time working with C++ over the years. And Rust came along, and it was a breath of fresh air, mainly because that the compiler uh, washed my back and stopped me doing these really stupid mistakes that I would get what I would just do in C++ and not find out about them until much later, right? And so because of that, I transitioned from C++ to Rust for my own personal stuff. Um, we don't live in a world yet where Rust is easy to do in, in a day job for a programmer. Um, it, it, I work in video games, so C++ is, is, is the king, and it's going to be a king for a very long time. There's only one company that I know of that actually write video games in Rust. And they're based in Sweden, and um, they provided the wonderful crate called Ash, which is a wrapper around Vulc the Vulkan API for doing 3D graphics. But uh, yeah, um, so really, it, it, it's 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 just one world completely separate from the other. So um, I have Rust in my evenings and weekends. I have C++ in my, during the day. And unfortunately, that's not going to change for a while. But I pretty much banned C++ from my personal life. It's too stressful. It's just, I, I, I rust, rust um, really holds your hand. And I find when I, uh, I do a lot of refactoring as well. So the, the, the style of program I do is that I write directly what I need to do and nothing more. I don't try to overthink things. And so when, when, think, when, when I need new features, I need to refactor. I need to change interfaces and stuff like that. And because of the type system in Rust, I can do that without worrying about it. The compiler going to catch everything. With C++, it doesn't. A question. Uh, if you want to do tricky stuff, it's very, very difficult to do it in Rust. And it seems that the C world and C++ world is more... Uh, is more Define tricky. I mean, just uh, deal with wall pointers, stuff like that. You want to get very deep down the, the system. You, you can do that easily in Rust. Um, uh, you, you, you might have to use unsafe here and there, but you, you've got the, the same pointer arithmetic and, and access that you have in C and C++. If you, if you need to do that, you can do that in Rust. It's just that I most mean, Rust code doesn't do that. You tend to keep that in one small part of your code and wrap it around unsafe and make sure it, it, it's, it is safe. I mean, if you're able to do those things in C++ in the first place, why do you bother? Because, because it's only a very few places in the C++ code base where you might want to do that, do those really unsafe pointed dereferences uh, just, just for performance. 80% uh, of your code is not going to need that. 80% of your code is just, uh, will benefit from catching undefined behavior and stuff like that. Um, like I, I, I'm writing the emulator, and, and I imagine that very little of that emulator, which has to be a really performant, will, will be written in unsafe Rust. Um, maybe the display code for updating all the pixels on the display by reading memory, I might switch into a safe and get a raw buffer or pointer, but not before I, 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 I check things, right, with this, with asserts or runtime checks around, around the outside as I enter into that domain. Um, because 80% of the time, I do, I'm not using raw pointers. Uh, even in C++, right, you're using using um, vectors or, or structs or things like that, right? And you're, you're very rarely using raw pointers in modern C++. You tend to use it for really performance stuff. Got it. Thank you.
to add to another why Rust over C++ in your spare time, I think just, again, just to say the borrow checker, like if mm -hmm. C, you, know, you can't bring in a borrow checker for C++ because so much of C++ code is allowed that the borrow checker would say no. <laughs> Which That's right. This, um, this could never I, be. <laughs> I, I, and I'm getting on now. I, I, I'm nearly half a century old. So um, my brain isn't working as, as freshly as it was. Uh, so that borrow checker is my best friend. Like I need that. Um, and someone's just, just mentioned uh, fearless concurrency. Um, and that's yeah, that's another true. In the modern in the modern day, you need to program on multiple cores, and still, too many people are using mutexes and uh, and and uh, semaphores and, and things like that when they should be using queues and and, and channels and, and and that stuff is really easy in Rust. It's so easy to to, to utilize your multiple cores and not worry about the horrors that you 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 you, you will experience if you try to do the same thing in C++. Just, just are you really sure um, you, you, you've, you've seen all those risk conditions in C++? Are you really sure? You're not. You're never sure, right? And when it does happen, it happens infrequently, and you, you'll never know where the source is. And it, and it just will ruin your week. Whereas in Rust, it will catch it. But C++ is awesome for all of the systems that already exist for it because Rust is pretty young and it's learned a huge yes. number of lessons from C++. It's taken... And, and other languages as well. <laughs> and other and languages, languages. Yeah. yeah. It's pulled in all your favorite things. Whereas with C++, it feels like whenever there's a new, really useful feature, you end up having to learn 15 years of history <laughs> before yes, you can get into uh, it, which is fine if you've been through it. But when someone's coming in fresh um, or doing it as a hobby project, there's just a lot of baggage to take on. <laughs> I agree, and, and, and the new features that creep into C++ tends to just feel like hack jobs. Like the, the C++ modules just doesn't feel right. In, and um, yeah. We'll wait and see, we'll wait and see. I'm, the yeah, jury's we'll out wait. on modules, don't, uh, don't knock it too hard. <laughs> <laughs> it could be great, but yeah. But it is well, hard it be worse. <laughs> well, yeah, you, know, you got to, this this header a CPP side of um, separation is is 50, nearly fifty years old. It, it came out, you know, it came out of seventy three, and it hasn't changed much since then. And it, it's been crazy how it hasn't. It's fifty years have gone on, and uh, that hasn't been dealt with. Oh, the C++ was in, in 73. I think C was before that, wasn't it? <laughs> you can't remember. Right, we've run quite over. So yep. if no one has any more questions, I think we'll probably call it call it a meetup. Um, if anyone's not on the Discord and you want to be, um, then just message on meetup, um, any of us who are, and we can we can send you the link. The, the kind of the permanent link got a got hijacked so it now redirects to some random spam page so we can't use that anymore so it has to be the temporary link um so just message one of us and we'll send it